Well, hello once again, everybody. It is so good to see everybody. Hey, just uh, sometimes we edit the other part out for later on, so I just wanted to make sure uh, I introduce myself once again to everyone that's watching for the first time online. My name is Eric Bucci, and it's, I'm so glad you're here. I'm the lead pastor, and uh, we're so glad if you're here for the very first time, never been here before, or you have not been here in a long time. Cornerstone, can you let everyone know that's new and online how much you love them? Nice and loud. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's so good to see everybody. We are in the process of going through a, a book of the Bible called First Peter. We're going line by line, verse by verse. And, you know, I really like doing that often. We do topical different ways. But what I like about going line by line, verse by verse, is that it brings up topics I might not pick on my own. And today is one of those topics. Today I'm going to be talking about what my job description is. And I would normally never want to talk about that, but First Peter talks about it. So we're going to talk about my job description and your job description, and what does that really mean? The good news, it's good news, because God doesn't have us here just to live and bear it. God has you and I here for a purpose and a reason. And when we surrender ourselves to God's hands and his design, God can do amazing things through us. And I'm believing God, great things are going to happen, especially in this time that we're going through right now. That's really what I want to encourage you, everybody. I really believe, more than ever, I, I, I really believe in urgency for the 21 days of fasting and prayer that are coming up, um, prayer coming up on the end of the month, and I just want to encourage you to participate with that. We're really going to go after God together, and we, we need God this fall. I, I really do believe, everybody, we're going to see some things in the coming months, and we really need to lean heavily upon God, and we need to be unified together in solidarity and purpose of Jesus Christ and not let the enemy divide us over non-issues. I'm just gonna say that out loud, okay? We gotta, we gotta unify under Jesus and not let ourselves be like the culture that's tearing each other apart. We need to be different than the world. The world is like, is like two pit bulls and a pit bull uh, kind of, an illegal fight <laughs> that I've never been to, okay? It's terrible. And we don't want to be that way, everybody. we got to be different. Come on, right? Amen. Let's be different. So we stand for truth, but we stand for Jesus Christ above it all. Now, this is not new. This has been going on for a long time. In fact, Peter, who wrote this book, was one of the first 12 disciples of Jesus. He wrote 1 Peter to a modern-day area of, of prim primarily Turkey and also the Middle East, in the, in, where the church was uh, dispersed because of persecution. Nero was coming into power. The total um, persecution wasn't quite released yet, but was starting to starting to gin up. This is about 50 AD, and he's talking to a church, basically telling them, listen, you need to get ready because difficult times are going to come, and I want to encourage you. And Peter was uh, the apostle of apostles. Every time there's a list of apostles in Scripture, he's always named first. And Peter's the one that denied Christ three times and blew it big time. So you're in good company if you've blown it. But the beautiful thing is, Jesus restored him. He restored him after Peter blew it. Peter was afraid. You know what Peter said? He says, even if everyone else bails, I'll never bail on you, God. And Jesus says, you'll deny me three times. He says, I'll never do it, I swear. He denies Jesus three times. Curses on himself. Blew it. Totally disqualified. You know what Jesus did? After he rose again from the dead, looked at Jesus. Jesus took him by the side in front of all the other apostles. He says, Peter, do you love me? Yes, feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. And Jesus is basically saying, what's really important, Peter, is that I love you and I trust you to take care. And he became one of the chief apostles. And it's with this backdrop we come to 1 Peter today. And we are closing out, uh, we have this week, and then next week we're going to talk about spiritual warfare, because he talks about the devil. So we're going to talk about the devil next week. Today we're going to talk about this, my job description and your job. <laughs> A little self-serving. No, it's not self-serving. This is very humbling. But I think it's important we understand our relationship to each other. If we don't understand why we're coming to church, why are we even here in the first place? Right? 
But what we're here for a reason. We're not just here to put a religious box. God has a plan and a purpose for us together. And I, I just wanted to give you an illustration of what I'm talking about. Right now, we see these a bunch of pixels. Pixels are a little light. And, and sometimes you're like, I don't know what God is doing. There's a lot of blur going on. And if you take a pixel on a schematic like this, you may be one little light. Well, what, am, what am I going to do? I'm just a little green. I'm just a little blot. What, what is God going to do through me? What is God going to do? And, and everyone in our culture today is like, it's my, I can shine any color I want to. Don't you tell me what color to shine. I'll be whatever I want to be. Yet God has a purpose and identity for each of you. And if we'll surrender to that identity, what begins to happen is he puts, begins to put us in a schematic. And you're like, what is this? It's a blur. But if we'll surrender ourselves, and this is the part of the church. The church is the body of Christ. If I'll shine my light in the way God's designed me, you shine your light in the way he's designed me. When you pull back, you see a beautiful picture. And sometimes you can't see the picture this side of heaven. Sometimes you don't know what God is doing. This is for somebody today. I don't know if you realize the father of our faith, one of the fathers of our faith, Abraham, when he died, God's not gonna make you a father of, of, of many nations. You're gonna be the father of a multitude. You know when he died, he had 18 people in his family. That's it. But he saw afar off. And so 1 Peter kind of brings that theme. And so God wants to arrange us in a place. If you and I will submit to God, and instead of trying to be yellow, be green, or be black, you're like, what, what, is, what is it? If you let God arrange you, watch what God will do. It's amazing what God can do when we don't care who gets the credit, except for Jesus Christ. And the world is longing for that, and that's what God wants to do through us. And so we've been talking about this. Your actions spring up from what you believe about your identity. It's going to review for a few moments. There is an, a major attack. I'm just a little pixel. No, you are part of God's plan. You are God's purpose. You are God's light. And so if you understand that you're not your own, you've been bought with a price, that God has a purpose and plan. You are not a random bunch of cells that got together and decided to become a baby. God has foreordained you before you were even born. And he has a purpose and he has a plan. Your life matters. And you don't have to be a victim. You can be a victor through Jesus Christ. That's the good news. So your actions spring up from what you believe about your identity. The enemy always attacks identity. Why do you think there's so much identity confusion today? The very, the very foundations of society is all confused. Jesus' identity was attacked. Do you realize that? When he, just before, when he went into the wilderness, the first temptation, the enemy said, if you are the son of God, went after his identity. If you are the son of God. And what will happen today, the enemy will go to you, if you're really a Christian, you wouldn't do that. You don't know who you really are. And this is the truth. And I'll say it a lot. Your sin does not define you. Your savior defines you. So we're a lot more interested, come on. God's interested, so we, we really don't, your sins are just, it's a problem. Yes, it's a problem. But your Savior is greater than your sin. And, and so don't run from the Savior because of your sin, because your sin does not define you. Your Savior does if you give up your sin. And this is what it's all about. And, and so God's called us, but you are, a, he's talking about the church here. You are a chosen race. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. That means you have a right to go to God. All of you are, quote, unquote, pastors. You're a holy nation. You're a holy nation, not the United States of America, not the UN, not the world. We are the world. No, we are of the kingdom of heaven. You are chosen. You're chosen, everybody. You're a race of a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of God's own possession so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who's called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light to shine like those pixels, to make a beautiful picture, and to shine a light upon this planet to let people know that God has a purpose and a plan. Now, today, my job description and your job. Okay, so uh, please, uh, I, I apologize ahead. It seems like a little self-serving, but it's not. Wait until you see what is required of me. All right, uh, in James 3.1, this is what it talks about pastors and leaders. It says the following. Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, 
knowing that as such, we will incur a stricter judgment. That's right. I, I'm seriously. Much is given, much is required. And, and I study the scriptures, and I'm, I'm called to lead this place. And you know, guess what? I, I am, uh, I'm accountable to the Lord. That, that humbles me. Uh, and so that's one thing right there. In fact, I, I heard a story of a metropolitan police exam that was given. This is in Canada. And uh, one of the people that, couriers of the, of the uh, test, uh, found an a answer to this question that was very funny. So I'm going to go ahead and just read to you. This is actually a written exam a number of years ago. This is the question that they had to answer in the academy. Here we go. You are on patrol when an explosion occurs on the next street. Upon investigation, you find a large hole and an overturned van lying nearby. Inside the van, there is a strong smell of alcohol. Both occupants, a man and a woman, are injured. You know he is an unlicensed driver and his passenger is the wife of your inspector. A motorist stops to offer assistance and you recognize him as a felon wanted for armed robbery. Suddenly, another man runs out of a nearby house shouting that his wife is expecting a baby and that the shock of the explosion has brought the birth imminent. At that moment, you hear someone crying for help, having been blown into an adjacent canal by the explosion. He cannot swim. Describe in a few words what you would do. <laughs> and this is what the applicant put down. Remove uniform and mingle with the crowd. <laughs> to be transparent with you, there's been times I want to remove the uniform and mingle with the crowd. Lord, I don't want to do this anymore. There's been times that's happened, right? When things happen and you're being, you know, I mean, uh, can I just be frank with you, even though I'm Eric? Can I just be a little real with you for a few moments? I can't tell you how frustrating it has been this past year that no matter what I do, people are really upset with me. People were criticizing me for getting sick, like it was my fault. I mean, emails, text, I mean, you don't believe the nonsense. And so I, I, sometimes I'm like, you know what, God? I don't need this. I gotta be honest, I feel that way sometimes. I do. I'm like, who needs this? No matter what I say, people are upset. And God says, get, get over it. So I'm over it. But, you know, sometimes it gets frustrating and you wanna take off the uniform. Sometimes you're like, I don't wanna even do the Christian thing anymore. Let me just kind of, no. God has us here for a purpose and a reason. So, Let's, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna read uh, chapter five, verses one through seven. We're gonna read the whole thing, and then we're gonna go back, and we're gonna look at each verse and break it down, okay? That's called, that's called line by line, verse by verse. All right, here we go. Therefore, I exalt the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and partakers of the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to you, to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will, be, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. You younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders, and all of you, clothe yourself with humility." towards one another. Wouldn't that be nice? I'm sorry. Okay, I'm going to continue to read. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. So here's the good news of the word of the Lord today. Let's go begin to break it down. He's, first of all, Peter says in um, chapter five, verse one, he says, therefore, which simply means everything before I told you, this is a result of that. So before we go forward, we need to look at what came before. Let me go ahead and read it. Therefore, I exhort elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ. So what he's saying here, we'll go back in a few moments. He says, I am an elder myself. He could have said, I'm the apostle. No, he says, I'm a fellow elder. Okay, among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ. So he says, therefore. Now, what is therefore about? Let's just go back a little bit. Uh, verse chapter uh, one, I'm sorry, chapter four, verse 12. This is what he talks about 
what this is there for, that whole discourse. He's talking about suffering and how you have to overcome suffering, all right? Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you. Guys, this is not heaven, okay? It's not heaven. Stuff's gonna happen, all right? So, beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you. The, let it test you, and that simply means, we talked about a couple of weeks ago, that God can purify you. When stuff comes out of you, Ah, oh, I, I, I didn't mean to say that. Yeah, you did. It's inside of you. Deal with it. De- like I had to deal with my, deal with it. Deal with it, okay? And let the pu- impurities come out of you. Make the test make you more purified. To test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice, later on he says, insofar as you share Christ's sufferings. What? I don't want to share Christ's sufferings. I want to be a rich kid. I want God's glory. Well, part of the glory is the suffering. I, listen, I don't understand it right now. I don't have time to break it down more than that. But listen, everybody, to fellowship with Christ in the middle of suffering. We talked about it in previous weeks. To share Christ's suffering that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Glory is, is God's presence all together. So it says in 1 Peter four seventeen, as we continue on, so he's basically saying, listen, Bad stuff's going to happen, but I want you to focus on what comes beyond this. One of my favorite books in the Bible uh, is Ecclesiastes because it deals with the futility of life. The whole book is like, it's all meaningless. Solomon, the richest man in the world, the wisest man in the world, he could have all the pleasure he wanted, all the wisdom he wanted, and at the end of his life, he said, you know what? Nothing means anything. Everything is worthless, like chasing the wind. You're like, why is that good news? It is good news. I'll tell you why. It says, everything is worthless under the sun. Everything is worse, worthless under the orb of the earth. If you are judging life by this life only, we are horrible. But we don't live under this world. We live out of this world. And because of that, there's always hope. And the best days, as I say almost every week, is ahead for those in Christ Jesus because heaven is our home. We are on a road trip and we're just stopping at different rest stops. This is not your home, okay? You don't don't set up a tent. You don't build a house in the rest stop. You keep on going. All right, therefore, he goes, I exhort the elders. Elders is presbyters, where we get the word presbyterian, overseers. And that comes from the Old Testament where Moses was under a lot of stress and Jethro said, hey, get some people to help you out. So what he did is he, got, he chose men uh, to be over a 1,000, some of a 100, some of 10s and 15s. He called them, basically, they were like elders. They were like under shepherds. They were pastoring the people so Moses could focus on the big things. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder. He says, I'm an elder too. And simply, another word could be a pastor. So he's writing to the people that are dispersed through the area, people that are over different church places, whether it's in a house. Most of it were in the homes back in those days, especially because of the persecution. As a fellow elder and a witness, a witness, which we get the word martyr from. The Greek word is martyr. It actually comes from the word martyr, it's a witness. Witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker of, also of the glory that is to be revealed. So Peter experienced some suffering. By the way, he's going to be killed not too, not too much after this letter is written. He says, I, I was a partaker in the sufferings and the glory. You see, Peter saw the glory too. On Mount Transfiguration, he saw Jesus kind of show his glory. When Moses and Elijah were there. Then, when Jesus ascended into heaven, he also saw the glory there as well. But he also saw the sufferings. He saw Jesus suffer in the garden. He saw him suffer on the cross. He saw him suffer and he saw the glory. Peter said, listen, the best is yet to come. Hold on. It's going to get better. Listen, everybody. Hold on. It's going to get better. I don't know how bad it is going to be. The best is always ahead for those in Christ Jesus. Because if you're in Christ Jesus, heaven awaits you. Boy, that's, thank you for agreeing with me on that one. <laughs> you know, sometimes it's good, I think, it's okay to, kind of like, it's not for my ego, it's, it's actually for, for God. It's good, you know, it's good news, right? So, fellow elder, 
Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. It's going to happen eventually. He says, shepherd the flock. Now, we don't really know what a shepherd is too much in our culture today. In New Zealand, there's more sheep than there's people. Uh, they know over there. But a shepherd basically would take care of the sheep. Now, uh, you never hear a sports team call. You hear the Rams, right? The Lions, the, you know. Uh, you hear all these, th- the Timberwolves and all these wonderful words. But no one, no one has a mascot. What team? Oh, where are the Lambs? Oh, what? The sheep are going to come to town and take you down. I mean, no one's going to have a, <laughs> bah, you know, and that's not going to happen. Uh, it's a bit insulting because sheep are kind of stupid. They are. They're not the smartest animals in the world. If they fall down, they just sit there. They don't know what to do. They don't even have the pennant. They don't have the life star. I mean, if they fall down, they can't get up. They, just, they don't even know how to press the button. I mean, they're bad. So they're, they're, they're bad news, and, and they have to be led. And they, they, don't, they don't listen, and they just do whatever they want to do. He says, shepherd the flock, and flock is a bunch of sheep. But you know what happens? <laughs> I read it. <laughs> I read in 2005, this is true, one sheep decided to jump off a cliff, enticing nearly 1,500 sheep, others to follow. Only the first 450 were killed. I know. Go ahead. You guys have so much compassion. Only, by the way, it tastes pretty good with mint jelly. But anyhow, it's beside the point. <laughs> Only the first 450 were killed as the remaining animals' falls were cushioned by the dead bodies below. <laughs> this is the point. One goes off, they all follow. You know, sometimes we're like sheep. Well, everyone's doing it, right? Everyone's doing it. This is what society is saying. This is what's right, and we all follow each other. If we're not careful, we're going off a cliff. And the job of the shepherd is to stop that from happening. Listen, I'm not calling you a stupid sheep. I'm not saying it. Peter said it. I'm one of the sheep too, sort of. But seriously, I mean, sheep have to be led. And this is what we're called to do as shepherds. Shepherd's job description. Here we go. Here we go. Protection from lies. And so our objective is to speak the truth to you, everybody, to let you know your identity is who you are in Christ, not your sin, not what culture says. And so when people come to church, I I really don't care about what you're struggling with. I want to bring you to Jesus because Jesus will give you an identity and then we can deal with the other stuff. So protection from lies. The truth will set you free but a lie will keep you in bondage. So we need to protect you from lies, to let you know the truth of who you are. Okay? And some of the most obvious foundations of society are being challenged today, and we must stand resolute, not in anger, but resolute with the truth. Correction from sin. And no one likes this one. Who we are to, the, Bible says, the Bible says we are to examine each other, and we are to test each other, and correct each other. Not those on the outside. Not to be arrogant, but man, if you're going the wrong direction, we've, we've had meetings where we've intervened. Listen, what you're doing is wrong. And, and there have been people that have turned around and made their lives better. And there have been people that have gone off a cliff and destroyed their families, destroyed their lives. So we are the correction from sin. That's part of what we're called to do. And by the way, sin means missing the mark. That's all it means. You think it's good, but it's not. It actually hurts you. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, 17, obey your leaders and submit to them for they are keeping watch over your souls as though we will have to give an account. We've had people say, I want to serve in the church. And I said, well, you're living a lifestyle that the Bible says is wrong. We cannot have you serve in this capacity. Oh, what kind of church is this? A church that believes in the Bible. And we, we got to stand with truth, right? So obey, leaders. Submit to keeping watch over your soul as those who will have to give an account. Yeah, that's right. I have to give an account. And by the way, I learned this a long time ago. This is not my church. When I first came to this church a number of years ago, almost 19 now, uh, I said to my, my former elder in the last church, I said, oh, my church, he's, 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 uh, Eric, Jim Castle, and he's like 90 years old now. Eric, it's not your church. It's the Lord's church. Don't you ever forget it. That's correction. He said it in a good way. And I, I, you know what? Every time I say, I always hear his voice. It's not your church. 
She said, that's what we can do for each other. It's not my church. It's the Lord's church, right? And so you are God's. And my responsibility, God cares about you. God loves you. And I'm an under-shepherd. I have to answer to the big shepherd, all right? You ever watch someone's kids for the very first time? I remember when I first, Luke was first born, I had no clue how to take care of kids. They hand me the baby, I'm like, uh, <laughs> I'm not quite sure what to do with this. Uh, what's gonna happen to his neck? <laughs> I was always, always worried. But the third child's like, whatever. But, but the first one, <laughs> have you ever noticed, I'm the third child, my, the first child gets all the pictures taken. My brother David has pictures of, I have no pictures of me anywhere. <laughs> Obey your leaders and submit to them keeping watch over you, your souls, as those who will have to give an account, let them do this with joy <laughs> and not with groaning, for that would not be to an advantage to you. So shepherd's job description is the following. Protection from lies, correction from sin, provision. That is the feed. And a shepherd will bring you to green pastures, but guess what? The sheep still have to go like this, okay? So we'll bring you. Our objective is not to hand feed you. Our objective is to show you this is the word of God. Eat from it. And I'm telling you, this next year, I'm really praying, I'm gonna, we're going to do one of two things this, ne this following year. We're either going to do the life of Christ or we're going to do through the whole Bible. I want to show you guys the Bible is edible. You can do it for yourself. Just yesterday, let me give you a testimony. Just yesterday, things were really bugging me. And so I got up in the morning and I made the mistake of looking at my phone. I'm, actually, I made a rule. I'll keep my phone out of my bedroom from now on. I've had enough of this thing. And I went in the basement. I made myself a cup of coffee. I read the one-year Bible about Nehemiah. And the Holy Spirit, it's like taking a shower. It's like, if you get out and you're all icky and sweaty from this horrible weather, right? And you take a shower. It's like the Lord showered me with his word. And he spoke to me. He comforted me. And I'm and he spoke to me about my family. He spoke to me about the church. Talked to me about what I'm supposed to do next year. And I wasn't even looking for that. I just spent time in his word. I want you to have that. God forbid that you have to wait for Sunday. You have to wait for some podcasts and listen to, and, and, and Caleb forget something. No, God wants you to eat. And so my objective is to help this church get and know how to eat their own Bible. Get the word in you, in fellowship with other believers. That's so important. Once you get that, then he gives you direction. We'll be talking more about that, okay? Provision that feeds. Also, care, meet the needs. We can't meet all your needs, but we wanna help people that are going through difficult times. Sometimes you're going through a difficult time. And direction. This is the way we should go in it. Okay, we're running out of time. We need to move a little quicker here. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, so you can see what's going on. Often God will show us ahead what's gonna happen. Not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, not for sordid gain. All right, so here's some dangers. Working from obligation. I gotta do it. Listen, there are days when sometimes you gotta go to work and you don't want to. Everyone has those days. But I'm talking obligation. I don't, I don't wanna do this. A, hired, a hireling. Jesus died for you. And this is what I've learned. It's really important. You know, uh, if I try to have, you know what happens? When I start getting stressed out, usually it means I care too much about what you think of me and how I think I'm doing for you. You know what I've learned a secret to get free of that? My secret is to love God. I'm gonna love God. God, and when I love God, guess what happens? I look at you appropriately. Now, I don't fear you, I fear God. And when I fear God, you can trust me. <laughs> and what happens is I begin to care more about you because I love God. So the answer is not to love the congregation more or the people in the church. The, 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 the answer is to love God first. And this goes for marriages. You want to love your wife more, your, your, your kids more, whatever, love God. The best thing for any marriage is to love God. And then you'll be able to deal with your wife or your husband or your kids or your parents. All right? So working from obligation. We don't want to be in that, that situation. Or pursuit of of greed for money. We see a lot of this going on. There's some preaching out there. You send a thousand dollars and God will, and they show some lady a new car and she has a brand new car and like, wow, this is great. Let me send my check in. I mean, that's really wretched. People make up the Bible like that and make it nothing more than God is nothing more than a slot machine of heaven. If it doesn't work in a third world country, it's not the gospel. Sorry. I'm just gonna say it like it is. 
There's a lot of prostituting out there in the name of Jesus. Put on the clone of Christianity. Listen, everybody. You may not experience your best life now on this earth. It's in heaven. Pursuit of greed for money. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor. This is about me, okay? <clears throat> Especially those who labor preaching and teaching. Just to see how awkward this is, everybody. Can help me out here, okay? <laughs> for the scriptures say, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out for grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. But with eagerness, not yet as lording it over them. Uh, for those allotted for your charge. So God has given, it's okay for someone to make to have a living in the church, okay? That's okay, that's fine. But we're not, we're not here to make money. We're not here to become wealthy and to live the lavish lifestyle, the rich and famous. If you don't know what that is, I'm bidding myself. All right, but with eagerness, not lording it over them. That means like, I'm, I'm lording it over you and these people and these people and start looking at you like you're just scum of the earth and I'm better than you. That's not a place to live, everybody. That's not a place to live. But, check this out. But eagerness, not as lording or over those, here's, here's the, allotted to your charge. What does that mean? Allotted, you get the word from lots. You know what lots they used to do? The Uman and the Thurman, they used to shake these lots and they used to believe the gods, the Greeks believe this as well, that the gods did the dice. So if I, if, the, if I did the lot and it came upon me, all the charge was my responsibility. So basically what it's saying is, your congregation is allotted to you. It's your responsibility. I'm giving you the response. You need to take care of this. Whoa. Okay? Allotted to your charge, but proving to be an example to the flock. That's right. We need to live the right way as well. And you know, it's, it's not easy sometimes. Sometimes you can't do everything you want to do. When you're a parent, you have to limit the scope of what you're doing for the betterment of the children. Okay? So working from obligation, you don't want to do that. Pursuit for greed and money. How about laziness? Just, eh, whatever. Eh, I don't care. You know, no, work hard. God doesn't want lazy. We should be eager to serve, okay? Or, or abusive leadership. This has happened before. Touch not God's anointed. And you, you use that power grab and all this power. My friends, it's not about that either. I don't have time to break it down any further, but that, or hypocrisy. You know what hypocrisy is, right? Saying one thing and doing another, and trying to, and, and you, I'm not saying failing, because we all fail. I'm saying you're trying, to, you're trying to put on an image that you're not even close to doing. And that's no good. That's hypocrisy. We all fall. But I'm talking about pretending to be something. You know, hypocrisy comes from the Greek word. In, in back in the old days uh, of uh, the theater of Rome and Greece, the, the, the actors used to have masks. So they, they have one actor play five or six different roles. And so that mask was called hypocrisy. That's where you get the word from, the Greek. So a hypocrite's putting a mask on. How about we just start taking off the mask and be real with each other? How would that be, everybody? Amen. And start helping each other and loving each other, all right? So, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive an unfading crown of glory. In the Olympic Games of old, they used to put like a, a reef around their head. Now, not reef, a reef around their head. And we don't believe that either, by the way, okay? Uh, but a crown of glory on their head that would not go away. And I heard a story of a man by the name of Henry who was in the 1800s to early 1900s. He was there in Africa, in Kenya, as a missionary for 40 years. He comes home on a ship to New York Harbor, and after 40 years, think about that. They had not been home for 40 years. Name is Henry. Come back. So 1905 or so. And they're going back. And all of a sudden they see people like clapping, flags. Like, and, and, and the wife goes, honey, do you think maybe that's for us? Wow, maybe it is. Then they realized Theodore Roosevelt, the president, was on the ship. <laughs> and he was coming back from one of his many hunting expeditions in, in Africa. So they, he kind of scurries off the ship, goes to their one room that the mission board gave them, says, honey, you know, we work for 40 years. The people that sent us are dead. No one knows who we are. Here I am in this room, one room, whole life. This guy goes hunting and kills a couple of lions, and he's a hero, and we spilled our life 
and resources for 40 years, and this is what we get. And his wife, like a good wife, like my wife's that way, saying, hey, honey, you have the wrong attitude. You know how many times Sanders told me that? Check your heart. And so, like a good husband, he checked his heart. He went away with the, with the, with the Lord and prayed, came back. His wife saw his countenance of his face different. He said, honey, you look like something happened. What happened? What did the Lord show you? He said, no, I was just praying, and all of a sudden, I, I, I was telling God, and by the way, it's good to do that. Say, God, I'm, I'm ticked off. He said, I, I felt like, like, just like I did yesterday when I got in his word. It's like the Lord's sitting with me in my basement. He, felt, he said, I almost felt a, a, a hand on my shoulder, and I felt like God said, the reason why you didn't get a reward, you're not home yet. Guys, we're not home yet. We're not gonna get it all now. Delayed gratification, this is not heaven. We must think beyond this place. And so he goes on to say about that, okay? And now, 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 I just gave you my job description. Now it's your turn for a few moments. You younger men, okay? Likewise, this includes women, by the way, in this context. Be subject to your elders. That means be subject to them. Follow me as I follow Christ. If I'm not following Christ, don't follow me. You know what they used to do when Paul used to preach? They used to check the scriptures. You should be checking the scriptures to make sure what I'm speaking is the word of God. Don't just because someone has, is gifted orator or looks cool or has a muscle t-shirt, doesn't mean that they know what they're talking about. <laughs> Be subject to your elders. Clothe yourself with humility towards one another. Humble to each other. It's not about me getting what I want. How are you doing? For God opposes the proud. Do you know what happens when you're proud? God puts a big linebacker in front of you and you keep getting knocked down. Some of you have been getting knocked down no matter what you do. I don't know what's going on. Could it be that you're proud? Well, let me ask you a, a quick question. When's the last time that you had a problem in your relationships and you admitted it was you? If you can't think of a time, chances are you're proud. If it's always someone else's fault, you're proud. And I've heard myself say, too, what this person, I'm like, wait a minute. Ooh, what about me, God? Okay? For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Grace is unmerited favor, which you don't deserve. Therefore, what are we to do, everybody? All of us, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he, when God lifts you up, my friends, nothing can knock you down. Pride is like air in a balloon. All it takes is one pin. Boop, you're gone. But when you, when God exalts you, no one can knock you out. No one can knock you down. He'll exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him. Do you think we have a little bit of anxiety right now? Gee, I wonder. Because he cares for you. You know what part of the, part of being Humble is, being humble, in the context of the, of the Greek language here, is about casting your cares on Jesus, on God. That's being humble. Not taking it on yourself. You don't have to carry the world. Give it to Jesus. God, I can't handle this. Good, give it to me. I got this thing. Nothing. And next week we're going to talk about the devil, okay, and how to deal with that. Because it, it, and we're going to springboard off of this next week. But let's end for now. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. I read just the last two points, okay? Be, be a humble person because if you are proud, God will be against you. I don't want God against me. Okay? Let's humble ourselves. C.S. Lewis says the following. I love it. A proud man or woman is always looking down on things and people. And of course, as long as you're looking down, you can't see something that's above you. That's my quote. I put C.S. Lewis's name there. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. I'm so proud. No. Be humble. God exalts you in due time. So I'm going to ask us to bow our heads first for a moment. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you so much for today, Lord. I... Lord, as I'm looking at this, I think of us all like being pixels, light. We're the light of the world. 
each of us has a different hue. God, I pray that we would stop trying to shine a different light than what we are. Father, I pray that our true identity, the identity that you've given us would shine forth, God. That we would not compete with each other, but we would complete each other. Father, I pray that you would draw, I pray even this fall as we get involved with small groups again, Lord, we pray that relationships would be built. That we would encourage each other that we'd be a people that work together. Father, I pray that you'd make me a good pastor, Lord. I want to be better, Lord. I want to do a better job for the people that you've entrusted me with, God, and, and vice versa, Lord, that we would work collectively together, that when people look at us, they would see a beautiful picture of you, Jesus. All of us, lifting your name high above it all, God. I pray for that in Jesus' name, Lord. With every head bowed and every eye closed, we do this every single week. How are you with Jesus? How are you with Jesus? If you were to die right now, how do you know you'd go to heaven? Well, compared to everybody else, remember, like those sheep that fell off the cliff. The sheep are wrong. Have you given your life to Jesus? The good news is this. You can't save yourself, and no one can. That's the good news. Jesus saves you. Jesus makes you right before God because he died and paid for all your sins because you can't pay for them. If you're willing to surrender your life today to him, that's part of it. The second thing is to believe he is the son of God, that he died on the cross for your sins and he rose again from the dead. You don't have to have all the answers today, but if you gotta at least believe that, I'm gonna lead you in a prayer. So I know better how to pray. How many of you would say today, Pastor, I, I never gave my life to Christ and today I wanna finally do it. I don't wanna, uh, I wanna give my whole life, not just part of it. Or maybe I used to walk with God and I've walked away and I wanna get right. Just, we had a couple people in the last service. Anyone say that this morning? Yes, I want to give my life to Christ for the first time or renew my commitment. Anyone this morning to be bold enough to go ahead and do that also online? Okay, let's just pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, I pray in your heart. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe you're the son of God. I believe you died, paid for all the sins I've ever done, and you rose again from the dead. Today, I step down from being in charge of my life. I give you my life right now. Take my life. It is yours. I also pray you'd forgive me of everything I've ever done wrong. Thank you. Based upon what you did on the cross and the confession of my mouth, I am now your child. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, we believe you became born again. Jesus tells us, he doesn't say, say a prayer and you're good to go. He says, no. He says, come follow me. And Cornerstone is a community of people that are following Jesus. We're all on a journey together. And he's called us to work together. So if you give your life to Christ today, there's several different ways you can do it. One way is you can text it. You can get your phone out and so put two and put believe. And there's a number up there is 860-499-4888. If you can just keep that up there for everyone to see. While I talk about the second way you can do it, there's a card in front of you in the pocket. You want to just pull that out and you can put on there, I made a decision today. Okay, and at the end of the service, you can put it in the box. Okay, finally, that's it. And then also, I wanted to say something else. There's four different ways you can give, and this again, you don't have to give; you get to give. Four different ways you can give the cornerstone. One way is through the boxes in the back. You can put your uh, to Cornerstone Church. You can put your envelopes there. Another way is to go text at eight three three two four five five six zero eight. You can get our download our app. You can go to cornerstonecheshire.com. Those are different ways you can give. Okay, everybody? And uh, I want to thank you for trusting God. And by the way, it's actually to your advantage that you give because when you give, God blesses you. Not so I can buy a Rolls Royce. I wouldn't buy a Rolls Royce. I'd buy a Maybach. But anyhow, that's beside the point. No, it isn't about that. But trust God and see what he will do. Let's pray. Father, I pray you bless this offering today, Father. I pray you would multiply it that you would utilize it to bless other people. We thank you that we're able to help people get off of drug addiction right here in New Haven through Teen Challenge that we support. We're thanking you right now that our children are being taught the word of God and that we're here right now. Thank you for the missionaries around the world. Thank you that we can shine the light together in Jesus' name. Bless everyone that gives and provide everything they need in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey guys, thank you so much. I know I had a, went a little longer today. And uh, so the kids are probably really getting impatient. But uh, as you leave here today, uh, we have our front people here today to pray for you, our prayer team.
And if you need to, someone to pray for you, otherwise, God bless you. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he shine his peace and grace upon you. Go in the love and the power and the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you guys.